So Sundays, I feel it's a good day to start off with a new and fresh topic. Since last two weeks, we have been talking about messaging and ultimately we are at the end of line for messaging itself. Yes, it's time for us to talk about Amazon MQ for Active MQ. So if you're ready, let's begin. So when we talk about this phrase, Amazon MQ for Active MQ, you must understand that Apache and Amazon are two different entities. And there is a message broker service, which is ActiveMQ. And remember, it's already there. Okay. And if you wish to have an integration of it in AWS, we in AWS provide you with a solution called Amazon MQ. I hope we can start this discussion with this. So coming back to what I already mentioned here, Amazon MQ is a fully managed open source message broker. And the other thing that AWS tells us is that Amazon MQ is a managed broker service for Apache MQ or Apache Active MQ that makes it easy to set up and operate message brokers in the cloud. So when we talk about fully managed, we can ask ourselves that what is AWS going to help us with? So remember this very carefully. So there is no need to provision any hardware and you don't need to install and maintain ActiveMQ software. And Amazon MQ manages administrative tasks such as software upgrades, security upgrades, and failure detection and recovery. It can also be integrated with Amazon CloudWatch. So you can monitor logs and matrices and generate alarms about potential issues to scale your resources. So when it comes to connection, if you have been using ActiveMQ, you should be rest assured when you're going to integrate it with Amazon MQ. And why am I saying this is because Amazon MQ uses standard APIs and protocols for messaging, including Java messaging service, NMS, AMQP, which is also called as asynchronous message queue protocol. And we also have the provision for using Stomp protocol. So there is basically your simple text oriented messaging protocol and MQTT or what we can call as message queuing, telemetry, transport, and WebSocket. And the best thing is whatever broker code or the consumer code or the producer code that you've already written, you don't need to change it. Just create the message broker for ActiveMQ in AWS and you can use it. So you might think, I can't relate to what you're saying right now. So I would ask you, do you remember AWS Aurora? So Aurora is a fully managed service. Remember that it's a service where you can create your own instances of of MySQL and Postgres. So if I ask you when using Aurora, did you manually install Postgres or MySQL on an EC2 instance that you have? No, absolutely no. It is managed by AWS. The same thing applies to Amazon MQ. So what I want to clear is that Amazon MQ provides you a service with which you can create your message broker for active MQ. So just create your message broker and use it. Okay, so I want to rephrase this once again. When we talk about this phrase Amazon MQ for Apache Active MQ, you must understand that Apache and Amazon are two different entities and there is a broker service which is already there which is called Apache Active MQ and if you wish to have an integration of it in AWS, AWS provides you with a solution called Amazon MQ. So I said a lot of things and some of you may not be aware of what all the terms actually mean. And if you don't, then don't worry. We will discuss this in depth. The terms that I felt might be new for some of you, I have highlighted them as there might be questions to the beginners. What are the message brokers or what are managed message brokers? What is active MQ? What are these protocols that I've mentioned here, including JMS, NMS, AMQP, Stomp, MQTT and WebSocket. So let's talk about them one by one and let's start off with message brokers and protocols and we will move on to the active MQ. Remember when I'm talking about active MQ, I'm not talking about Amazon MQ. I'm specifically talking about active MQ, which is Apache's active MQ. Okay, so don't get confused with that. Now I won't talk in technical terms. Let's start off with a simple story based visualization. And by the end of this story, you will get to know and you will have a clear idea of message brokers are. So there are three people who went to an information center to get some information about things that they wanted to know. For that, they have kept several division of people who are at the center and these people are here to help these individuals who seek information. Okay, so, so here we have the three users who went to the information center and they are seeking some advice or they want some information. 
As you can see, user A and user C went to the information center and said, hello, sir, good morning, can I get my package? So the information center forwarded their messages and they got the response back. There you have your package, thank you. So this is a basic communication channel between the people who want to have some information. They have been to the information center and they have received the information back or the answer back. Okay, so here you didn't speak to the department directly, but you spoke to the information center, which in turn forwarded your request to the concerned department. Okay, so you would want to debate me on this, like now all of the users that we have were speaking English or English speaking people and the department was also English speaking, so the communication was successful. So what will happen if the concerned department was not of the same language? Okay, so that's a valid point. Wait, wait, I am having the same question and let's see the situation here as well. So the information center also has the provision that if the user is asking for the information in different language, so here, if you see the visualization, the English message was received by the English department and the Spanish department was communicated well with the users of Spanish language and the same here with the French speaking person. So you might now ask me that, okay, they have departments with the concerning languages. What if I have to talk to the department of different language? So let's suppose I speak in English and I want to speak to, let's suppose, French department. That's a very valid question. So for that, the information center has deployed three agents which allow you to talk to the department with other languages as well. So if you see, we have the three agents that are sitting there. And the user who speak English is now able to talk to the department that speaks French. Okay, so these three agents actually help us to communicate with languages that are not our own. So now if you can see, we are able to communicate with cross languages as well. So if I am speaking in English, let's suppose I say, hello, sir, good morning, can I get my package to the French consulate? They can as well respond to me in French, but I'll be able to understand that and I'll be able to, and I'll be able to receive the message back. So now, if I tell you that imagine the users to be applications or services and the departments to be as other applications or servers or databases and the information center that you see here to be the message broker and the agents to be the messaging protocol, then will you be able to relate to it? So now let's understand what we have actually learned. So this is the current scenario at hand. Now let's see if you can relate to it, what I just asked. So let's see this. So just like you were not able to talk to the services directly, and even if you were not having the understanding of the language that the department was, you were still able to communicate with each other. This is what the message broker helps us with. And our message broker here is the information center, obviously, isn't it? Yes, a message broker is a service that helps the application that we have, the system and the services to communicate with each other and exchange information. And remember, even if the application are written in different languages, you don't have to worry about that. You can still send your messages and you will be able to communicate. So as I already told you just now, a message broker helps our application and services to communicate with each other and exchange information. And how does it do that? So the message broker here does this by translating messages between formal messaging protocols like JMS, NMS, AMQP, Stomp, MQTT and WebSocket. So you might ask me, what is a protocol then? So a protocol or communication protocol is a system of rules that allows two or more entities of a communication system to transmit information with each other. Okay, so the communication systems may be your services and they are able to transmit information between each other using these communication protocols. You might have heard the term, we have to follow the protocol. In army terms, they always say that we have to follow the protocols, isn't it? So obviously, it is a procedure or rule that has to be followed or its propagation, isn't it? So remember this thing very carefully. We have listened to a lot of words such as TCP, UDP, HTTP. What are these? These are protocols, right? So TCP is a transmission control protocol. So if I say it is a transmission, what does it transmit then? It transmits or it's used to exchange data using the internet protocol that is over packets. It's simple. So, and I want to ask you one thing, like have we ever asked ourselves how the data is converted into packets and how is it received to the customers or the consumers? We should know that. So my request to you is read about how protocols communicate.
okay so coming back to the topic if we have to communicate with each other and we don't understand each other's language we should have a protocol through which we have to communicate and that is where the protocols that i have mentioned here comes in place what is jms then jms is a java messaging service protocol what is mqtt it is a message queuing telemetry transport protocol what is amqp it is a asynchronous message queue protocol all these are protocols that can be used for different and various reasons or in different scenarios so all these protocols have an agenda that defines the rules the syntax the semantics and synchronization of communication which in turn helps us with standard error recovery methods and in this case is for message transmission and its propagation and that is how services with different languages may it be python or java are able to communicate with each other using these messages and one more thing that is prominent is that message brokers can validate store route and deliver messages to the appropriate destinations and the way it does is by using these protocols so i hope this point was very clear to all of you let's move on and when we look at the most prominent message brokers gearman we have ibm mq we have rabbit mq and i think the most popular one that you guys have already heard is kafka and the one which we will be talking about today is active mq so this is what we will discuss now till now we have discussed what is a message broker how they work how they propagate and help communicate messages and now we will move on to the service provided by amazon for active mq so even if you have never used a message broker this is going to be very simple for you if you want to use amazon mq and if you wish to learn more about the message broker then create two services and install active mq create a producer and a consumer and see how it works but we will do that in a small hands on demo so don't worry about it as well okay so now let us replace our message broker with the one we are going to discuss now here we have our active mq so what the organization tells us is that active mq is the most popular open source multi protocol multi protocol remember that it means that it works on multiple protocols java based messaging service or java based messaging server so it also supports industry standard protocols so users get the benefit of clients choices across a broad range of languages and platforms and it also provides connectivity from c c++ python .net, and many more languages mqp protocol and you can exchange messages between your web application using the stomp or web sockets so stomp basically is your simple text oriented message protocol and you can also use this to manage your iot devices using mqtt so in this on premise design as well what we can see here is the same we have different applications in our on premise service in our on premise servers which communicate with each other using the active mq message broker so service 1 can communicate with service 5 and service 2 can communicate with server 4 without having the dependency of using the same platform okay so now let's see if we understand what we began with so amazon mq makes it easy to migrate messaging to the cloud while preserving the existing connections between your applications and it supports industry standard apis and protocols for messaging including jms nms amqp stomp mqtt and websockets this is pretty much cleared now i guess this enables you to move from any message broker that uses these standard apis to amazon mq usually without having to rewrite any messaging code and if you have used sqs and sns you know one of it actually supports queue based messaging and the other one is for the pub sub messaging and here you will be interested to know that amazon mq has these message broker distribution patterns and messaging styles so the first one we have is point to point messaging and the other one is publish subscribe messaging so it supports both of them so here you get benefits of both the messaging styles and patterns so i hope you might have got some idea by now about the topic you aren't aware of and now you might ask me what would happen if you don't want to have instances placed on your on premise for active mq and you want some other solution that helps you to remove that dependency of managing the message broker on aws and you want to communicate with the cloud applications so if you have this question then amazon mq is the right place for you so for the hybrid architecture what aws tells us is that amazon mq is a aws managed message broker service for active mq that enables organizations to send messages between applications in the cloud and on premise to enable hybrid environments and applications 
and for the application communication you can also invoke aws lambda for queue and topic managed by amazon mq brokers to integrate legacy systems with serverless architectures as well and here if you see the legacy system or the on-premise application sends the message to the on-premise active mq message broker and then it is propagated to the amazon mq which will act as the message broker for the applications on the cloud so that is why i said if you have code that is already written you don't need to change it you can use it the same way with the hybrid architecture as well we will not dig deep onto this because this may not be needed much for the exam but as i want you to understand as much as possible i wanted to share all the details that can be put here for the series so we'll make a series on message brokers so if you haven't subscribed already please do that i think this was clear let's move on so there are five things here that are very important to understand when you work on message brokers with Amazon MQ. So the first one is the broker. So the broker is a message broker environment running on the Amazon MQ. So that is a broker itself, which runs on Amazon MQ. And the second one is the configuration. So the configuration here contains all the settings that you have for your Amazon MQ broker in XML format, which is basically similar to your ActiveMQ's .xml file, the configuration that we use. And you can define your requirements in the configuration file. And the third one is the engine. So the message broker engine is a type of message broker that runs on the Amazon MQ. So this is basically like a version or setup file that you install as a part of the Amazon MQ. So there can be multiple versions of ActiveMQ, right? So you choose one of the versions and you can install that just like we have for Postgres. So you can have multiple versions of Postgres that are available to the market and you can choose one of them to install it. And the storage when uh, here, when it comes to broker storage, Amazon MQ uses Amazon Elastic file system or amazon efs for broker storage as with efs you can have multiple replications over multiple az's and you can as well if you want to use ebs you can do that so it supports both efs and ebs as well and there are a few caveats for using ebs here you can use amazon ebs only with the mq.m5 broker instance type and one more thing that is really important for you to understand is even though you can change the broker instance type after creating the broker, you can't change the broker storage type after you create it. Okay, so you cannot change the broker storage type after you have created the broker. So you have to decide it very carefully whether you're going to use with the Amazon EFS or you're going to use EBS. And Amazon MQ uses Apache Kaha DB as its data store. And you can read more about this in the documentation as well. And the last one is the user itself. So the user here or the ActiveMQ user is a person or an application. So it can be a person or an application that can access the queues and topics of an ActiveMQ broker. So remember these things very carefully. It will be helpful for you when you're using Amazon MQ. So now we have discussed about the on-premise and hybrid architectures. Now let's talk about the ways we can use Amazon MQ on AWS. The first one will be Amazon MQ single instance broker. The second one will be based on Amazon MQ's active standby broker for high availability. So a single instance broker is comprised of one broker in one availability zone. So the broker communicates with your application and with Amazon EFS by default or with Amazon EBS. So here we have both the designs as well. One which uses the Elastic File Store as the message broker storage and the other one which is using Elastic Block Store as you can see. And this is basically your single instance broker, which means it will be hosted on a single instance in one availability zone. So let's move on to the Amazon Active Standby Broker for high availability. So here in Amazon MQ Active Standby Broker for high availability, what happens is that we will have two brokers each in different availability zones, which will be configured as a redundant pair. So what it means is that these brokers communicate synchronously with your application and with Amazon EFS. So if you see here, we have the application and there are two instances of Amazon MQ and two different availability zones for high availability, which communicate to the EFS instance for its broker storage. So you have to remember here is that at one point of time, one instance of Amazon MQ will be active and the other one will be on standby. So with this architecture, only one of the broker instances is active at any time, while the other broker instance is on standby. So if the instance at the AP South 1A is active, then the instance at AP South 1B will be on standby. So just to keep you assured, what AWS tells us is that if one of the broker instances malfunctions or undergoes maintenance, 
it takes Amazon MQ a short while to take the inactive instance out of the service. So hence what happens here is this allows the healthy standby instance to become active and to begin accepting incoming communications or requests. So in this case, if the instance at AP South 1A fails, it will be taken over by the instance at another availability zone that is AP South 1B. And as they work as a redundant pair, they communicate with the same EFS for the broker storage to pull messages needed to perform the operations. And when you reboot a broker, what will happen? The failover takes only a very few seconds. So it allows you to ensure that you have ample fault tolerance and high availability. And Amazon MQ provides a service level agreement or SLA of 99.9% .9 for active standby message brokers. So it's a very big thing when we talk about having fault tolerance in place. Okay, so I hope you got the point here. Let's move on. And security is a very important thing. So let's talk about security at Amazon MQ. So Amazon MQ provides encryption to the messages at rest and in transit. And as I've already told you that all the services, most of the services that you use in Amazon will be having encryption of messages at rest and in transit. So it basically helps us to ensure that your messages that you have are secured completely in an encrypted format. Here you should remember that the connection to the broker uses SSL and access can be restricted to a private endpoint within your Amazon VPC, which allows you to isolate your broker in your own virtual network. So everyone who wants to design their private architectures can use this feature to secure their message broker. And if now you ask me, you said that on-premise will be able to talk to the Amazon cloud message broker. How is that possible? I hear you, my friend. I agree with you on this, but we will talk about this in VPC. I'll explain you how this actually works. For now, you just remember that you will be able to protect your message broker using the private cloud or private endpoint. And you can as well configure security groups to control network access to your broker. I hope you know the security groups. So in this case, we can use security groups as well. And the good thing is Amazon MQ is integrated with AWS Identity and Access Management, which will provide you the ability to control the actions that your IAM users and groups can take on specific Amazon MQ brokers by using IAM policies, isn't it? And the next best thing is authentication from applications to the active MQ broker itself is provided using the username and password based authentication. So you can be rest assured that your own people will be able to make changes or deploy or change configuration on the message broker. Okay, so I hope it was clear. So this was a very interesting topic. I feel with the closure of messaging, we can happily now move on to serverless architecture and discuss how a Lambda works. And that's what our next topic of discussion will be. I know you guys might be feeling we are going slow, but design these things, it actually takes a lot of time. And considering we are targeting all the spheres of members who may not actually have adequate knowledge on cloud infrastructure, we have to elaborate a lot on these topics, which are being neglected elsewhere, I feel. That's what I feel. So if you're new and haven't been able to learn cloud before, I welcome you all to the channel and I promise you I won't let you down. So please support this channel and please like, share, comment on what you liked, what you didn't. And please, please, please do subscribe to the channel and I'll meet you in the next one. Until then, it's Pythonic signing off.